Hello, and welcome to the Pricing for the Planet week. It's day five. During this entire week, you got the chance to hear a bunch of like experts about this topic around sustainability. We talked about market research. We talked about green premium. We talked ab about really get, getting into the details of how you monetize sustainability. But for this day five, we wanted to explore another area. Indeed, if you are in an industry with low willingness to pay, or you just figure out that there is no way you can use green premium, there is always the supply chain to leverage. So today, I'm super excited to have actually four experts to talk about supply chain and the link between supply chain and sustainability. Maybe to start the discussion, I will let every single one of, of those experts, you know, introduce themselves, just, you know, name your, your, the company you are working for and, you know, maybe your expertise around this concept of sustainability and supply chain. Maybe, Nate, if you don't mind to start. Sure. Thanks, Fabian, and thanks for having me. I'm Nate Chinenko. I'm a principal at a strategy consulting company called Ducker Carlisle. We're based in the United States. I live in New York, and I have been working in supply chain for this is now year 12. And especially over the last few years, my group has been doing a lot of research into the intersection of supply chain and sustainability, which I'll get into a lot more detail on. But we're getting a lot of questions and a little bit of pressure from our clients to start paying attention to this and come up with some ways to assist them. And I'll share some of those results with all of you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Nate. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your, your research. Alexi, do you want to, uh, to go next? Sure. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. So I'm Alexis uh, Yerogiannis. I'm based in uh, Paris, France. I uh, work for uh, Synchron. Synchron is a, uh, a vendor supply chain planning uh, software. And uh, I've been involved with uh, supply chain consulting for the last uh, 23 years, uh, particularly focused on uh, aftermarket supply chains and how we can uh, optimize them to make them more efficient and minimize also their uh, impact on the, uh, on the environment. Perfect. Cedric, I think you are live from London, right? Yes, Fabien. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Cedric Deleas. I'm, um, I'm a supply chain professional. I've, worked, I've been working in supply chain for 15 years in the food industry, in Danone and now in General Mills. And I've always been in, very interested in, in the sustainability aspect of supply chain. I'm trying to embed that aspect into everything we do here and then the different companies I work with. Perfect. Uh, and then I, I kept you for the end, Jordan, because I think it will be super important and super interesting to have your thoughts about supply chain. But, you know, it's 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 a teaser. I let you kind of share a little bit more. <laughs> I'm kind of the, I feel like I'm the black, I'm the black sheep in this group. So, um, hey everyone, my name is Jordan Wolf. I'm the um, founder of Cultured Supply. Um, and for the past five years or so, I've been a full-time angel investor um, along around the thesis of changing the way that we make stuff. So I'm really interested in um, how we can move from large centralized dirty systems of production to more decentralized clean systems of production. So most of my activity um, is actually working with scientists and engineers inventing a lot of this. So things like biomanufacturing, low cost lab automation, new types of fermentation technologies. So I'm actually coming at it much more from, I guess, from the startup the startup world. Um, and it was through that work that, um, you know, if you think about the reorientation of, of how we make things from centralized to more decentralized, that means we can create new supply chains from scratch. And so that's what gave me the itch um, to create a software system. And we're, our initial niche, niche is focused on algae. Um, to to basically create a software system to allow people to source and procure algae directly and algae derived products directly from the source without a bunch of middlemen. Nice. So maybe first question, Nate, because you, the research that you've done in this space is super interesting, and that's really what we are trying to convey today with pricing for the planet, and especially this week. It's like you can achieve both. You can you know having cost savings, efficiency gains, while actually lowering your CO2 emission and, and improving your impact 
on the planet. Can you share a little bit more about your research and what you've seen as a professional in this space? Yeah, and I'll give a little bit more background before I get into the specifics here. A lot of this research is based around our supply chain work, and a lot of our supply chain work is primarily with motor vehicle companies. So think big auto companies, Ford, BMW, Mercedes, Volkswagen, Toyota. And they've got supply chains that move the cars, and they've also got supply chains that move the parts for the cars. And one of the things that we have encountered with all of these companies, not just the ones that I mentioned, but like the entire industry, especially the motor vehicle industry, is people want to do the right thing with sustainability. They want to make an impact on sustainability. And they're often looking for, for better or worse, the cheapest, quickest, maybe the lowest hanging fruit way to make that impact. But sustainability is such a broad topic, it can be very hard to like triangulate your efforts effectively. So one of the first things that we started doing in our research was stripping out or segmenting out aspects of the supply chain that are a little bit more challenging to calculate or comprehend and can be hard to make a difference in. So if you're thinking about like a traditional sustainability organization trying to calculate scope three emissions. So that's like the emissions from the production and all the energy associated, and then also the customer's use. That customer use piece is like almost impossible to calculate. And a lot of our clients feel like, hey, we make cars. They produce a lot of emissions. It's going to dwarf whatever emissions we make from any other source the entire time that this thing is out there. So like, why even try? Um, so one of our first recommendations is let's say, hey, let's take customer use out of here. Like you've got to move parts, you've got to move cars. That's that's out of your scope. The second thing we do is say regarding the manufacturing and the production, which is of course extraordinarily carbon intensive and has a huge sustainability impact. If we get too focused on that, the supply chain, like the true core supply chain professionals who are really responsible for moving a thing from point A to point B in the most efficient manner, they also become a little bit disenchanted. They're like, well, you know, we put a lot of, we got leather in these things. We got steel, iron, aluminum, all of these raw materials, all of these natural resources go into making a car. And I have no impact. I have no ability to control that. So we've gotten a lot of success by focusing on the actual supply chain that our clients can impact, which really starts with inbound transportation, getting the product into their warehouse or distribution network from its source. And then we take that through outbound transportation, getting the product from their distribution network to, in this case, it's often a dealer or a distributor, but it could be directly to an end customer. So creating a clear scope has been really important for us to start to make an impact on sustainability. We also try to be, we try to segment even within there. So for example, almost all of our clients have installed LED lights in their warehouses. This is like the lowest hanging fruit that exists. And it's amazing because it really is a positive sustainability benefit. And it's probably the easiest one you can do first because you can get this information when you go to the local home goods or hardware store, LED light bulbs save you money. So it's the simplest business case that could possibly be out there. Unfortunately, LED lights also don't have a huge impact on a supply chain the size of like Volkswagen's supply chain. So we try to pick different areas of focus in warehousing where there's things like lighting, but also things like having a recycling program but even beyond that, like putting a warehouse in an area where there is abundant water instead of putting it in Phoenix, Arizona, here in the States, or some which is very water constrained, you can put it in an area where there's abundant water. Um, solar panels on the roof can be a long payoff period or something like that. We get even more benefit for sustainability when we look into the packaging portion of sustainability, because there you're using our clients, at least it's mostly cardboard packaging, but plenty of wood, aluminum, some steel, a lot of plastic packaging as well. And then really the piece where we've been putting a lot of our effort is in the transportation part of the supply chain. So when we look at our clients 
and how much carbon they emit or how much, you know, what their impact is on overall sustainability outcomes, about 65% of their carbon emissions are from just one type of outbound transportation. And it's over 90% from the outbound transportation piece in general for many companies. Um, but outbound plus inbound, pardon me, is, is well over 90%, with warehouses and packaging being a smaller proportion of that. So a lot of our research and focus has gone towards that outbound transportation piece. And trying to effectively calculate that can be really tricky because companies require information from all of their transportation carriers. You know, there are plenty of big companies, and my focus is North America, so apologies for the international audience. I'm going to use some North America-centric examples that are global companies. Um, Amazon, Walmart, they run their own transportation networks, but any company one tier down from there typically does not run their own transportation network. And this means they don't have access to a lot of the data and information that they might like to have, like fuel consumption. They don't even necessarily know exactly what equipment was run on a particular route. Um, but we've built a system to extrapolate from the data that they do know and allow them to better understand the data that they don't know so that they can start making some positive impact there. The low hanging fruit in transportation is really switching modes from air to some sort of ground transportation. The challenge is, again, we, we try to approach this strategically, switching from air, which is quite fast, to ground, which is quite slow, has an impact on the customer. And I think I'll have a chance to speak about that impact on the customer and how we sort of rank and score that and some strategies we've developed to keep the customer impact minimal while saving, in some cases, a lot of money, uh, and in even more cases, a lot of carbon emissions to get there. So if I hear you well, Nate, it's really your message is like, if you have to prioritize around supply chain, transportation is probably step one, right? Yeah, I think that, yeah, I, I'll give you a little bit more complicated answer. If you are looking for quick wins, you can find most of those in warehousing and packaging. If you are looking for the biggest impact, that is almost definitely in transportation. Super interesting. Both are great. Both are great. They, the world will be a better place if everybody can take some action to both of those effects. So I do not want to downplay the impact that good sustainability work and tactics in warehousing and packaging has, but transportation is really the big difference maker within that part of the supply chain we've identified as our core scope. And maybe a question to, to maybe Cedric and Alexis, is it something that, that you are seeing as well, you know, this you know, huge opportunity around transportation, especially around CO2? Yes, uh, absolutely. I can go first. So, so very good points. And exactly, transportation is uh, uh, key in uh, improving sustainability. Uh, we have typical supply chains consisting of some central facility. Things are shipped from all over the world, so traveling very long distances to the central uh, facility. Then this central facility ships to regional warehouses. In depending on the type of supply chain, we might have a third uh, step where we ship to branches, uh, dealers, uh, stores, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, transportation to be uh, optimized, uh, both in uh, optimizing where do we ship from. So in many cases, we could do direct shipments from a supplier to a regional warehouse. In many cases, we could look for local suppliers. They might be more expensive, but uh, uh, the uh, impact they have on the uh, uh, environment, the reduction of CO2 emissions is important, and we need to start taking that into uh, uh, account. And of course, also shipping uh, full containers as much as possible. So this is also something, uh, full containers, full cars, full vehicles, full trucks. So this is also something that we see as, uh, as uh, key in reducing the, uh, uh, the, the, the impact. On the and do, do you have a number, Alexis, to share maybe with, because I, I believe that Synchron is, is doing exactly what you describe, right? So, so do you have kind of like a, an order of magnitude in terms of impact? Well, uh, 
one of the areas where we're uh, making an impact with uh, optimization software like uh, Synchron is on the uh, reduction of uh, air travel that uh, Nate also mentioned. So one of the reasons why companies ship by air, it might be that sometimes they have uh, dedicated this uh, mode of transfer for some kind of operations, but a lot of the time it is because they raise emergency orders. So when something goes wrong, a product is not available, uh, they say, okay, I cannot wait for a boat or a truck. I need to do it by uh, uh, by air. And a lot of the companies we uh, uh, contact, especially in the automotive uh, world, they tend to have a ratio of 70% emergency order, 30% uh, stock orders. And uh, with optimization, improving the availability of the products, you end up needing less frequently the emergency mode, which is more expensive. And typically, we switch that around. So instead of doing 70% emergency, we do... Uh, 70% normal orders and 30% or less emergency orders. That has a huge uh, huge impact on the uh, CO2 emissions. Interesting. And Cedric, maybe from a completely different industry, is it what you are seeing as well in like the food and beverage type of like industry? Yes, I think I, I could agree with Nate and, and Alexis. I think the um, I think it really depends on the scope in the first place. So if you, I think Nate introduced that very well, right? It's scope one, scope two, scope three. If you're looking at scope three, transportation starts playing a smaller role, uh, especially in the food industry, where actually agriculture is a big part of the of the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so looking at scopes is 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 the first one, the first thing, and the second thing is the footprint of your company, right? So if you have a pretty decentralized supply chain with your little production uh, sites dis- disseminated across the globe. Um, your distance to customer is smaller, and so I think that that makes um, a smaller part of your of your of your footprint. But I do see exactly the same. I think even in the scope three, even the um, decentralized uh, supply chain, you see transport being 20, 30 percent of your uh, of your green gas, greenhouse gas emissions. So completely agree with that with that aspect of the of the problem. I do see as well manufacturing being a big part, right? So depending on the industry, again, manufacturing for us has been a big part of our of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And sometimes tackling manufacturing uh, manufacturing emissions brings other benefits. You know, I think Nate mentioned putting solar pa- solar panels on on, on warehouses or, manif- or, or or factories that reduces your greenhouse gas emissions. That reduces your cost too, right? So especially in an environment of energy prices going up. Um, that's that's a really good way to really reduce quickly your your costs. And I love that because you know I and I I cannot explain the reason, but we see so many companies and individuals thinking it's a choice, you know, or, or you know it's a, it's either I'm sustainable or I'm making profit. And I think it's it's hard for a lot of people to realize that well, actually, you you by being sustainable, you can make more profit or you can decrease your cost. So it's like it's a win win for everybody. Maybe one thing, especially because I think the, the concept is really interesting, if you don't mind maybe hearing Jordan about this, this approach of, of like like complete shift toward a fully decentralized supply chain. After that, I would love to have your thought about you know the, this approach maybe. Sure. Um, well, so this is the reality. The, the, it, from my perspective, I mean, the last industrial revolution that just brought like basically miracles, right? Completely affordable food, medicine, clothing, like in, in global supply chains and global trade. So it's like super, super efficient. Like it's actually super low cost. Um, now we won't get into what's inside those products or what that does to the hum- humans or planets, a separate conversation. But m- the reality is like, if you're going to want to create an alternative system, you have to outcompete the current system based upon pure market fundamentals, right? So like I've seen it enough where, um, especially from like, I guess the startup side where it's like a lot of great people working in sustainability and large organizations, but the large organizations, they're focused a lot of times on they're focusing on maximizing value to shareholders in a lot, a lot of times quarterly reports. They don't take a very long-term view because that's not where the incentive structure is, right? And so what I get excited about this, to your, to your question about the centralized production, is um, with what's coming down the pipeline with where the small, I see the most interesting investment in a lot of talent working is across the world or across the, the, the whole world of manufacturing, um, robotics, AI, 
automation, all these kind of pieces starting to come together. Um, and to where you can imagine now, if you really lean into the automation side, like to actually have smaller scale footprint factories that actually can compete. Um, and I think that's the only way that you can realistically create, you have to, you have to where you can create more decentralized production. So we're at the very, very front end, front end of that. Um, what I would say is the more near term thing for me, which is kind of what we're trying to like, what we think about is, is the function of wholesale distributors. So, um, well, essentially the wholesale distributors are controlled by their customers. So essentially the large companies control the supply chains through their distributors. So there's choke points everywhere that exist. And so what we're really interested in is, you know, why do these, it's a question for maybe some of the panel, why do these companies need to take 30, 40, 50% of the margin sometimes? Because that does two things that increases the cost, the more middleman increases the cost and then more than, and also it actually elongates your supply chain. So we're really interested in this idea of how do you kind of bypass that middleman or create the systems to help bypass that middleman to get to shorten supply chains and get prices cheaper from point A to point B on, on products. Yeah, maybe I can react to that first, Jordan, because there were two points in there. And the first one was about how can we get this decentralized supply? And so just an example from the automotive industry, people, I think, colloquially think without having put a ton of thought into it, like, oh, I bought a Toyota, it must be made in Japan. I bought a Hyundai, it must be made in Korea. I bought a BMW, it must be made in Germany. And that is sometimes true. But in reality, at least in North America, the vast majority of cars on the road are made in North America because they are huge and very expensive and costly to ship. And it's cheaper to make them here in North America, even with much higher labor prices and material prices. But the smaller the thing gets, the easier it is to move it a long distance. And so that's an important input there as well. However, that is also starting to change even in the motor vehicle industry. One of the things that a lot of our clients are either interested in or piloting, and in some cases have rolled out is using 3D printing technology, which is like the perfect example of it, fairly easily automated roboticized like micro production technique. And the way that they're using that to great advantage is for fairly low volume parts where the alternative is buying 5,000 of them from Asia, putting them in a container and shipping them over um, at, at a penny a piece, plus the $5,000 for the container, that's pretty cheap if you need 5,000. But in many cases, they only need 50 or five. And in that case, it's much cheaper for them to pay $10 rather than a penny a piece not have to ship it such a long distance. And it's often more sustained. There's less waste in the manufacturing process, but most importantly, you're not shipping a container across the Pacific Ocean every time you want to do this and then scrapping a bunch of the unused or like overstock parts there. So I, I totally agree with you. Like this is just in the 12 years that I've been in this industry, an area where some automation micro production has come online. And I expect as 3D printing technology improves, that will continue to get better. We work with a lot of legacy businesses and there are a lot of legacy business factors standing in their way of doing that. And the most frustrating thing about why it's not more common, it's not the cost, it's not the difficulty with logistics. It is a combination of not having the right engineering drawings in a way that the 3D printer can ingest them, and then also not being able to get engineering approval on the 3D printed part. Both of those are totally solvable problems that you don't even really need to spend a lot of money to solve. You just need to reprioritize your internal team. And if you made that reprioritization internally, you would get much more sustainable outcomes simply by Maybe, maybe in the worst case, you need to hire a few extra engineers. But if each engineer in an organization got a task, hey, you need to convert three drawings every month to be able to be 3D printed, or you need to validate one part out of the 3D printer every month in order for it to be usable on a car, homologated usable on a car, then that would be super effective. And it would make a big leap forward, I think, in sustainable outcomes there. So I, I could not agree more. And then unfortunately, like a lot of the 
big legacy businesses are slow to do that. I think that's also such a huge opportunity for a smaller business, the likes of which maybe you would invest in to get into this space because the big legacy companies are so established in their processes, they're not keeping up. So who wants to go next? I see Jordan and <laughs> Cedric competing to talk. <laughs> go, uh, go, go ahead, Cedric. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I just wanted to kind of build on what just Nate and Jordan have said. Um, I think, you know, we came out of COVID uh, with two buzzwords, right? Uh, words in, in supply chain. One is resilience and one is agility. And we, we asked supply chain to be resilient and agile. And uh, most, of the, most of the time, you, we've left uh, supply chain professionals wondering how they can do that, right? Can do both of them. But I think um, what we talked about is two different things. We talked about um, data, automation, AI, digitalization, um, and our workforce being more digitally savvy as well, right? So uh, as, we, as we look into the future, I think that is one big change. And the second big change is um, that the supply chain are moving from being support functions to being value creative, right? They, we're not asking anymore just the supply chain to service customers and to cut costs. We are st asking them to kind of bring value to the companies. And so I think technology is going to be a massive enabler of this because we're enabling, uh, we're enabling uh, um, employees to manage a more complex supply chain. We automating some of the um, some of the processes they're making. Um, but we're doing that in a way that can add value to the companies. So now supply chains do uh, still need to kind of service their customer and their consumer at the lowest cost possible, but they need to be resilient to geopolitical and market changes. They need to be uh, to mitigate new impact of new regulations and sometimes relocating, uh, you know, re rethinking their network, re-engineering their products, rethinking the, uh, the location of their manufacturing is how supply chain become uh, resilient to, uh, to, to changes in the marketplace. That's how they, um, they, uh, they, they respond uh, and add value to the business because not only they, they can service customers at the lowest cost, uh, but they can as well uh, bring a diff um, um, s um, added value from a green uh, credentials point of view. They're not only mitigating operational risks of being in a, not being able to supply a, con a consumer or a customer, they are mitigating business risks, which is, hey, I have a new regulation in this market. Uh, how do I adapt to it? How do I adapt to a new tax on packaging? How do I adapt to a new tax on carbon? So uh, they, they bring that extra value and they bring a differentiation versus their competitors. Um, more and more, I think we'll see consumer being more and more aware uh, of the importance of sustainability. Um, and so making decisions on the product they buy based on these green credentials that company will be able to put forward thanks to the supply chains. So I think this is a, a good enabler to the challenges that Nate and Jordan have just talked about, even for big corporations, because they can just bring that forward and sell their product on that green credentials. Super clear. Yeah. And Jordan, yeah, you wanted to. Jumping. Yeah, it was it was just something to add to what Nate said, which is like something I feel like I feel so strongly about. Like, and I, this is coming at it from like you know, you know, I live my life in a world where we're failing like ninety percent of the time, right? And the people around me are failing ninety percent of the time because you're trying and you're trying and you're pushing the boundaries of whatever, especially in the world and the science and the technology side. And I say this all the time to a lot of people that work in large organizations. And Nate, you mentioned this, like even in your, your additive manufacturing example, it's like, just pick one thing or just like, or just do something small because it's all about progress over perfection. And one of the biggest challenges when it comes to anything around sustainability or anything new to implement around supply chains or carbon emissions is we need to bring the cost of all these technologies down. And anyone, <laughs> we all know you know, business 101 is you bring costs down with scale. And so I always say if organi large organizations who have large budgets, they just pick small ways to like 
small pilot projects, small things to make progress that helps the, 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 the startups and the people developing these technologies or even other large companies developing these technologies to bring the cost down. And, you know, you have to game theory it out a little bit. I think the reality is this, like most large companies, like they're doing it for other reasons. At the end of the day, they have other incentive structures in place. And I always say, well, if you're really serious about improving these efforts, like then just figure out a way to like procure certain things, even at a small scale to help bring some of these costs down. Um, and verse looking at it this way, which a lot of corporations do, which is like they essentially just outsource their R&D and sign these, you know, co- you know, research collaborations where they end up tying these startups hands behind their backs versus just procuring stuff. And I think, um, yeah, I, I just think I wanted to add to that because Nate, I think it's really important because you can run your example across basically so many different functions of a, mm-hmm. of, of a large company. Yeah, I think one of the points you just made, Jordan, was about like, let's be willing to try new things. And I hear a lot of excuses about why not to try new things in supply chain. And I've been in the supply chain for so long, honestly, I don't really have a good perspective of what life is like outside the supply chain, but it's a chain. It's right in the name and everything is interrelated. So any action that party A takes has some impact on not only party B, but C, D, E, F, et cetera. And whether that impact is, oh, we don't have enough data or that's going to bother somebody or we're not sure how to implement that, or that's going to have some effect on our warehouse processes or our transportation processes. Like, it's really easy to say no to something, even something that might save you money. And so when it's a when something that might save you money and might have some sustainability benefits, like we hear a lot of no about those things. And I think people would be better served by thinking in a more cross-functional way. Like, how can we make this work? How can we think about this more positively? Which Jordan, I suspect, like, although you're living in a world where people fail 90% of the time. I'm living in a world where people succeed like 95% of the time. And that stifles their ability to innovate. And totally. it's going to really slow down their transition to a more sustainable, better supply chain. I totally agree. Great transition because so the title of this Pricing for the Planet Week, it's where to start and what to do. So I would love to ask you know every single one of you these questions. So maybe Alex, if if you don't mind starting, so what what should be your your response? Yes. Uh, first, one remark about uh, something that I think Cedric uh, mentioned earlier. I really like the idea of using the uh, green credentials and the sustainability uh, uh, impact as a differentiator. So companies don't need to be afraid of these uh, changes. In fact, they can uh, use them as differentiators to. Uh, uh, make the consumers and their customers uh, prefer them compared to other uh, to other companies. Uh, now, how can we go about it? I think increasingly, and I will of course talk a little bit from the supply chain optimization uh, uh, background. Uh, I think increasingly we need to ta- start taking CO2 emissions and environmental impact more into account when we make a strategy, when we make a report about how we're doing, and so on. For example, in the optimization world, we have all these powerful algorithms that try to uh, uh, make things better for a company, to minimize the uh, inventory, to increase availability, minimize transportation costs. Increasingly, we need to take into account, and this is what we're doing also at Synchron, uh, the emissions, the CO2 emissions, the, uh, the environmental impact. And uh, this is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, something that has two aspects. One is to actually develop strategies that not just improve the uh, uh, availability of products, the revenue, and so on, but that also reduce the CO2 emissions, uh, making plans that show you the impact that uh, different stocking strategies, supply chain strategies will have on the CO2 emissions, and then monitoring, uh, tracking the CO2 emissions to see are you meeting your targets or uh, or not. For example, we have developed a, a methodology to look at the uh, uh, transportation distance, weight, mode of transport, and come up with uh, reports and analytics to show what have been the uh, CO2 emissions, and this can help you track, identify areas where you need the improvements, see what might be causing a, uh, a higher than expected CO2 emission and uh, and improve it. So my key message is really taking the CO2 emissions into consideration in your uh, uh, company strategy, reporting it to the market, and uh, eventually using it as a differentiator. 
And Alexi, if they are in the industrial space, I, I guess Synchron can do all of that, right? Yes, exactly. And uh, one key aspect that we haven't touched upon and that uh, plays a big role in this uh, optimization towards sustainability is also the use of the circular economy. So every time we produce something that we could have uh, uh, instead refabricated, remanufactured, and so on, we have a negative impact on the uh, environment. This is also something that can play a role in uh, minimizing the CO2 emissions. Super clear. Who wants to go next? I can go next um, because it, it, it does it does ring a bell. So I think, and we talked about uh, about uh, small steps. I'm gonna just build on the different aspect that what the different panelists have said. So I would start with the corporate vision. For me, um, our supply chain needs to be aligned with the company strategy because that's how you in, you unlock investment. That's how you unlock focus. Um, and so influencing at the leadership level, making sure that uh, you agree on the ambition, the target, and sometimes the trade-offs is very important. So my recommendation in this space is go and try to influence at that level. The fewer targets, the better, because uh, you focus on the big bets, you focus on what you want to be known for. So that's very important. That's that's number one. For me, number two is data and technology. And I, that's, that's why I wanted to build on what Alexis has said. Um, Investing today in your data and, and technology foundations is very important. First, it's going to be super useful today to track your financial performance, your cost savings anyway. Uh, but it's important as well as you move to kind of more the sustainability field that you can't make an action plan if you don't know where you stand. So, and you can't build uh, a target and uh, an improvement plan if you don't know where you are today. So that's building data and analytics is the starting point for your plan on um, knowing where you want to, when, uh, when, you, when you have your ambitions, where you want to go and how you get there. So, and it's not an easy task. I think Nate said that before uh, earlier saying, hey, um, if I want to measure my GAG emissions, I need to collect data, not only internal data, but external data. I need to reach out to all of my orders and figure out what are the uh, vehicles they're putting on each of the lanes that I, I, I contract, right? So it's very time uh, consuming. Uh, and and just because we don't have um, cross organizations um, data sets, so we need to go and reach out to each of our different uh, third parties. And that's uh, that's going to be a big push between now and, and in, in, in the next few years, right? Um, so first one, they, first of one, corporate vision. Second, second for me is build that data and technology, uh, because as soon as you have that data points, then you can turn on and fit that into your tools. And that's what Alexis has said, right? As soon as you have that planning uh, ecosystem, and you can bring in cost, service, GAG emissions, any any metric you want to bring in that you've aligned with your you know, with your corporate vision. Your system, your people, your teams, and even your your automated um, algorithm will help you make the right decisions for the right outcomes. So you'll be able to balance the financials and non-financial uh, performance indicators that you have. And the third one, which I think is building on what Jordan has said, which is around a hey, small steps, small steps first. I would say I completely agree with that. We tend to say we're gonna stop sourcing A to source B, and, and everything will move from A to B. We're not saying, hey, let's take 10% of A, move it to C, and 80% stays on B, right? So I think what we could do is being a lot more agile with this, and my advice would be to package it with, uh, with, our, with, our, with our business in a different way. So right now, we need to package it. When we have a green initiative, we need to package it in terms of business risk mitigation is one, and the, or cost saving. And if you hit one of these two, uh, it's it's m much easier to unlock investment in your company, especially in the current uh, environment where investment is hard, inflation is high. And so I think being able to say, I'm mitigating a business risk or am I, I'm saving you money and that has benefits, as green uh, sustainability benefits is, uh, is actually the way to start making small steps towards sustainability. Nate, Jordan. Go ahead, Nate. Uh, okay. So this is going to sound like it's totally off topic, but I really like to race bicycles. And 
in bicycle racing, if you want to buy a new bicycle, there's like, you're trying to optimize the bicycle you buy. I want something that's really light because I don't want to take a really heavy bike up a hill. I want something that's really aerodynamic. So it cuts through the air nicely. I use less energy and I want something that's really cheap because I don't like to spend money and you can't have all three of those things. And obviously we're familiar with this optimization in supply chain as well. I want fast, I want high quality and I want cheap. So I want my products Im immediately. I don't want there to be any mistakes along the way. I don't want them to get damaged and I would like them inexpensively. And when you optimize fast, good, and cheap, you almost always end up with unsustainable. So not always, but almost always. If you can collect a little bit more data and as Cedric said, incorporate either for cost saving purposes or for risk mitigation purposes and put those into your optimization and add sustainability as an element to that optimization, you can get some really surprising outcomes pretty quickly by incorporating sustainability. So let me give an example of how this historically has worked. And Alexis, you'll know how this works because it is very much like parts supply chain, which I know Synchron is focused on. Um, you're trying to ship parts and they're, let's pretend they're auto parts. And many of you, perhaps not all of you own a vehicle and have had the experience of going to a service point and the parts are not where you want them to be. They're not at the dealer you go to or at the service provider you go to. So what happens in the historical supply chain is that those parts get, and Alexis mentioned this earlier, they get placed on an emergency order or an expedited order and air freighted from wherever they were to the closest point to you or directly to the service location. And that air freight is, as we discussed earlier, very, uh, very unsustainable, big emitter of carbon. Uh, but it optimizes the fast, good, and cheap because that's, an, that's a situation where I really need something fast and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get it there fast. Without sustainability in your optimization parameters, you're going to end up with that result every time. But once you add sustainability, you start to open up some new pathways. For example, you could probably avoid running out of stock in that product if you had just carried slightly more inventory. Perhaps on a normal business, you might carry a month of inventory in your dealership. If you can carry six weeks of inventory instead of four weeks of inventory, you don't need to air freight things as quickly. And you can make a lot of you can make a lot of sustainability savings. Once you add sustainability to your optimization, you realize that it may also be cheaper to carry a little bit more inventory and save yourself all of that air freight cost because air freight is quite expensive. It optimizes the fast end of the spectrum, but it does not optimize the cheap end of the spectrum. So particularly for a certain subset of parts. Now, this isn't really useful. Like, let me give a more basic example. Like, and Cedric, you'll probably laugh at how over oversimplified this is. If you're running a food distribution network, like the milk that everybody drinks that is very, very fast moving, you almost never would air freight milk in or something that's very fast moving because you probably have it in stock already. Uh, you probably also don't want to stock in your grocery store something that sells once or twice a year. That's never going to make sense. And you probably would be better off putting that in an air shipment. But what we've learned is that every company has some subset of their parts or products that they sell that make up a disproportionately large percentage of the expedited emergency air shipments that they have. And I think the that is both a tangible, like tactical thing, look for the parts or products that are making the worst sustainability impacts. But more strategically, I think adding sustainability to your optimizations can get you some different outcomes than you perhaps have been expecting. And in some cases, those outcomes are better 
than your existing outcome, and they're also more sustainable. But you'll never get there without thinking about how to optimize sustainability. Um, cool. Uh, I think I'll come a little bit of a different angle of saying, you know, what is some actionable thing that, that can be done now or how to implement? Um, I'm going to use this example because it's an example that actually happened recently. I won't na- mention the name of the company. Um, but a large retailer, um, that does, uh, own, own several different types of retail stores. Um, they had launched this new entity adjacent to the company focused on, biomaterials, new sustainable materials. And there's this whole story around they're starting a separate thing. They're going to invest in startups. They're going to do co-development agreements. They're going to do all of this stuff. And that's all great. And, but my position was if you, cause they were, they seem very dedicated about helping to build these value chains, which is actually what actually needs to happen. If we want more sustainable alternatives in every aspect of business, we have to build the value chains around these new technologies. And as I mentioned before, the only way that we can do that so they can make business sense for the vast majority of the market is you have to procure that stuff to help bring the cost down. And I had this very interesting conversation with them. I said, well, if you're interested in biomaterials and you want to really build the value chains and you own the distribution anyways, because you have these l- large number of retail stores, the best thing you can do for the ecosystem is actually buy these materials for a, a select group of products that you want to make. And I'm like, create a capsule collection, create a limited run edition, promote it through directly through different unique channels. Um, and you and you already have the footprint to actually sell through the product, but like that is such an easy way to me to like just start. And like if it doesn't sell well, try another product. If it doesn't sell well, try another product. And instead of this whole big thing, we're going to create this whole entity and do all these other things and invest in the startups. But then like at the end of the day, it's still connected to this big large corporation who's going to make the decision that's in the best interest of the company. And so anyways, I'll come back to that same thing. I think it's it's just so clear for me if we want to really move the needle. And if you really want to move the needle in new sustainable alternatives for supply chain for companies, we have to invest in these technologies to bring the cost down and the products. And to me, it's that simple. I don't, I don't, Otherwise, the rest for me is kind of like it's just going to take much longer. So, guys, thank you so much. Uh, And maybe I would add one more thing in terms of like, like you know, what to do and and where to start. And I think you you didn't mention, and I was expecting that from at least one of you, but like education. I, I think that's something that we see a lot. I think there is this blurry idea about sustainability, supply chain optimization you know, GAG, all the, all the kind of things. So, you know, you know, excited to add this, you know, education layer. And that's what we are trying to do with pricing for the planet. So again, for, you know, for, for your time today and for all your insight and, and very interesting points, thank you so much. For the audience, at the end of the week, the last uh, roundtable will be actually tomorrow and it will be kind of a conclusion of this entire week. Thank you so much for your time, your interests, and I would say, you know, see you in the next video.